right, Mr. Chair, you are now live. Thank you, Julian. All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the City of Annapolis Board of Appeals special virtual meeting for February 17th, 2021. The meeting's being broadcast by the city on the Annapolis YouTube channel. My name is Bob Gallagher, chairman of the board. In accordance with the city policy during the pandemic emergency, this virtual meeting allows the public to observe the meeting through a video link and to submit written comments through the city of Annapolis website. Links to the YouTube channel, the comment form, and the city's database for cases before the uh, board tonight uh, may be found on the uh, agenda for tonight's meeting. The people that you see on the screen are members of the Board of Appeals. When a case is called, the representatives of the parties to the case will also appear on the screen. Also participating in the meeting are counsel to the Board of Appeals, Cheryl Woods, our recording secretary, Tammy Hook, and one or more city employees running the broadcast. Tonight it's uh, Julian Jock. Also participating, there may be other representatives from the city, including Sally Nash, Dr. Sally Nash, Director of Planning and Zoning, Joelle Braithwaite, Assistant City Attorney and Counsel to the Department of Planning and Zoning, and one or more members of the planning staff. We ask everyone but the members of the board to mute their audio. If anyone else wishes to speak during the meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you to speak. As I mentioned earlier, written public comments uh, were accepted through the city website. Comments on matters before the board tonight that were submitted up until noon today have been made part of the record and forwarded to the members of the board and the parties in advance of the meeting. In order to allow additional comments in response to matters arising at the meeting at the hearing tonight, the record will remain open in those cases in which evidence or argument is received tonight until our next meeting on March 2nd. Uh, any additional comments received until noon on March 2nd will become part of the record and forward to the members of the board and the parties. So let me remind everyone that communications with the board about any case must go through the comment form. Do not attempt to comment members of the board directly. We'll begin the meeting tonight with the roll call. So I'll ask our recorder, Tammy Hook, to call the roll, please. Mr. Gallagher. Yes. Mr. Zazali? Present. Dr. Chen? Present. Mr. Burnett? Mr. Walsh? Present. Mr. Dews? Present. All right, thank you. We've got a quorum. Have the members of the board had a chance to review the agenda? Are there any yes. suggestions or corrections? None. Move to enter into record. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right. The agenda is approved. Uh, the first item on the agenda tonight is approval of the minutes for February 2nd, 2021. Any corrections or additions to the minutes for February 2nd? I have a motion to approve the minutes. I move, I move to, to, oh, sorry. Go ahead, David. I'll, I'll <laughs> take that as a motion in a second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Aye. Thank you. All right, that brings us to our first case of the evening. Special exception 2020-005, application by the city to allow construction of a new public works building at 49 Hudson Street. So, uh, Julian, if you'll bring in the interested parties in the Hudson Street matter, we'll get started. Bringing them for it right Good evening, now. Kevin. Good evening. Kevin, tell me when we have everyone we need to have. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thanks. Mr. Chair, everyone has been brought forward at this point. Is did you bring Leo Wilson over? Uh, well, there's two Leo Wilson, so let me let me do the other Leo Wilson. Because I think he does audio on one and video on the other. He just likes to be complicated. That's all. Yeah, that's probably it. Okay. 
And when Brian Adams, he's with the city. We may not, may not need him. And Matt Waters. Okay. All right. So will those who may testify tonight in the Hudson Street case, uh, please raise your right hand. I don't see your hand up there, Leo. There we go. That's the right one. Uh, do you swear or affirm subject to penalties for perjury that the evidence you're about to give is true to the best of your knowledge? I do. Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Kevin, you'll be introducing us on behalf of the city, will you? Yes, I will um, keep it short. My name is Kevin Scott. I'm a senior planner with the Department of Planning and Zoning. <clears throat> this is a city project. It's the City of Annapolis Public Works Maintenance Facility uh, to be located at 39 Hudson Street and project number SE 2020-005. Project is concurrently undergoing site design review, which will be heard by the Planning Commission tomorrow night for SDP 2020-003. But tonight we're just here for the special exception. This is an I-1 zone, an industrial district, and the use is very much an industrial use, but it falls into the category of other government and government related structures, facilities, and uses. So as such, it's a special exception use in the I-1 district. The same use, if it was by a private entity, would just be permitted by right. But because it's government, it's a special exception. So that's why we're here tonight. Um, we've reviewed it for all the review criteria in chapter 2126 and find that it complies with all of those criteria. We're recommending approval of the project. Uh, do you have, have you received evidence that the proper notice and posting has taken place? Yes, we, uh, we have the advertisement in the newspaper, mail notices and posting on the property is all done according to the code. And the comments we got from you this afternoon are the only public comments? Yeah, uh, we received two letters from uh, business owners or employees, one or the other, that, um, for, that have businesses on Hudson Street with concerns dealing with traffic and um, safety parking issues with the operation of Hudson Street. And then the other item I forwarded to you is simply the applicant's presentation yeah. tonight. So you have that in advance. And that should be entered into the record as well. Would you like to briefly address the traffic and uh, parking issues? Well, it was found that a traffic impact study, at least the formal one, is not required for this because of the, um, the level of service you know, with the number of trips. The uh, Transportation Department reviewed that and confirmed that assessment. The parking on Hudson Street shouldn't be an issue caused by this facility because all of the parking will be handled on site. Including employee parking? That's correct. All right, so who would like to speak for the applicant to start off? Well, I think I'll start us off this evening. Um, first off, thanks for uh, taking the time to review the project. We'll try and move through this fairly quickly. Uh, my name is Leo Wilson with Hammond Wilson Architects. And tonight you're gonna to hear from a couple of different people here. It should be a pretty quick um, review, but um, we're gonna start with um, Michael Johnson giving us a little bit of background. He's the director of the Department of Public Works for the city. Then Terry Schumann, the architect of the engineer with Bay Engineering will talk about site issues. Deb Schwab will talk about landscape issues. And then I'll talk about architectural issues and then we'll stay on to answer questions or um, follow up discussion. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure we need all of that. Um, as you know, the, we've got a very diligent board and they've read and reviewed all the materials that you all have submitted. Why don't we just start with a, more of an overview and see if we have questions. Well, that sounds fair. Um, and, um, it's funny because I hear all my uh, attorney friends tell me I have to get all of this into the record, but I believe everything's been filed with the city already, including the issues related to the site design um, and special exception criteria. So those are in the record and we believe we meet all of those. So I just want to say that. And then- um, and, and, yep. and because, sorry to interrupt you, Lee, but because public comments have mentioned the traffic issue, if you would address that, that would be great. Sure, we'll talk about that too. Um, but first we'll let Michael talk about the project to get us um, started and we'll, we'll move through this very quickly. So Michael, you wanna say a few words for us? 
Um, sure. Uh, thanks, Leo. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, board members. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Johnson. I'm the Director of Public Works for the City of Annapolis. And um, this evening, we're glad to have the opportunity to present the plans to the, you know, the board. I, I'm glad that uh, the board has diligently reviewed them. And um, this is for the PW maintenance uh, facility proposed to be located at 39 Hudson Street. As uh, everyone's aware, this project has had some history here in the city. Um, it's been in the planning phase for several years and it was originally proposed to be over at the Spa Road site. And the city, um, you know, based on um, further uh, due diligence um, studies felt that the location over on Hudson Street was a superior one. Um, it acquired the property and um, we have, are assiduously moving forward with getting this uh, ready for uh, construction. Um, as Leo mentioned, uh, we have a full team here this evening that can field any questions or concerns that the board may have. And at that time, I'll just turn it back over to um, Leo for the presentation to begin. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Great, thank you. So um, again, briefly, we'll run through some issues related to the site and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen if uh, we are set up to do that. We're gonna start with this. <coughs> Okay, so can everyone see that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm gonna change this. Uh, there we go. Let's just leave it like that and we'll move through it. So um, Terry Schumann is from um, Bay Engineering and he's our project engineer and he can talk about a broad overview of issues related to uh, site and civil. So with that, I'll turn it over to Terry. Hi, um, hi all, hope you can hear me right, everybody. Yeah. Uh, my name is Terry Schumann um, with the site design team. I'm uh, with Bay Engineering Incorporated uh, and I'm the site engineer on the project. Um, I will be brief and try not to be duplicative uh, um, as indicated. So th this slide, what we really wanted to just show this slide because it just gives um, the location of the site in relationship to the surrounding areas. You can see Route 50 to the north. Um, our access point is off of Hudson Street where our, our property is identified in yellow. That's the limit of this property. Um, it, it has, you know, Hudson Street is a cul-de-sac road, so essentially a dead-end road, and it um, derives access out at West Street in close proximity to the Route 2 West Street intersection. Uh, the, I just quickly going around the site, there's a couple features I just wanted to describe. The, there is an overhead uh, 66 foot wide uh, BG easement that goes along the east side. It crosses Route 50 over near the hospital there. And I'm sure you've all driven underneath Route 50 and saw those overhead lines. Uh, to the south is a floodplain stream area. And just on the other side is the Monarch Academy, um, the recent Monarch Academy school. So it kind of gives you the old, uh, the, the orientation of the property. All the other properties along Hudson Street are, are all, again, industrial zone properties. Uh, they are the armory, the, the used car dealerships, uh, or uh, Harley-Davidson dealership, uh, and just varying other commercial and industrial uses. Uh, let's go to the next slide. This is just uh, an existing feature plan. Now this blows up our property, uh, the subject property for tonight. Uh, again, has an address at 39 Hudson Street. Uh, 6.9 acres is the total acreage. It does have some floodplain areas along the southern area uh, and part of the site is wooded. Um, and again, we are zoned I-1 industrial district and special exception um, for government related services and hence the reason we're here tonight. The, um, the property is not within the critical area. Uh, it's close to it, but it's not within the, uh, the thousand feet of the, of the tidal waters. So we're outside the critical area. Uh, Hudson Street is uh, a county road. So that's owned and maintained by the county. And on this site plan, there's a kind of a dashed line, but the, the northern and the eastern boundaries are basically the limits of the county city jurisdiction line. So that's where the city ends and the county begins. Um, I wanted to point out from this slide too. So prior to this purchase from the city, there was a, a site development plan that was reviewed and approved through the city. A grading permit was was issued for a warehouse and parking lot. And uh, they they went ahead and cleared the lot, set up sediment controls and 
the heavy dashed line is their limit of disturbance. So that that that's already been cleared, and it, it generally is in that state right now, cleared with sediment erosion controls. So I, I think let's go to the next slide, please. So this is just a this is a colored rendering of uh, of the proposed site plan. So uh, we will have two access points off of Hudson Street. Uh, there'll be some visitor parking right in front there. And then the, the building right below that, we call that building number one, that'll contain the administrative services of the building, also repair shop and warehouse and storage areas with access to those in the rear of, the, rear of those buildings. Uh, the next building over is a um, what we call building number two, that is the vehicle storage um, building. So that again, it, it is what it says, it's, a, it's storage for vehicles and, uh, um, and just to the east or to the west of that is the salt barn and the material storage bins. So these are open storage bins for different materials that, that uh, the public works need them on a daily basis. Uh, the remaining uh, gray area right there is just uh, all the em employee visitor parking, uh, fleet vehicle parking and the circulation around these buildings uh, that they'll, they'll be able to function. Um, uh, the dark green area, uh, just point out that I'll get into that a little bit more in, in a bit, but that's the, uh, those are the wooded areas um, and also flood floodplain areas down by the stream. So let's go to the next slide. And there was some talk about the, um, uh, the parking. So I just wanted to talk about that. This, this slide represents, uh, again, the site plan and we color coded some of the parking there. So um, we, we have a total of 112 spaces being provided on this site. All the parking requirements will be provided on site. Um, we have a, a, an administrative daily staff, 25 spaces. Those are represented by, those, uh, by that teal color. So we have some parallel spaces along the one drive. We have visitor parking up front and then some, some vehicle parking in the back. So those will, those will be the required administrative daily staff. Um, and then we have 87 spaces. Those are represented by the green areas. And those are, um, those are for the fleet vehicles and um, we're, we're considered storage um, spaces. So the idea is that when that, not the idea, the, the plan is that employees will come on their shift. They will, some of them will drive there, some of them will carpool there. Uh, they will, um, and th th those will be fleet vehicle employees and they will, they will pick up the, the fleet vehicle that's in the parking space. They will park their car in that same space or another designated space and then use the, the fleet vehicle for the shift. Yeah. When they come back from their shift, they'll replace their, their um, work vehicle uh, and, and, and then take the parking space away. So, you know, working with the public works on their program, um, we will be able to, uh, and there's also gonna be, let me also say, there's also vehicle storage inside the building and that vehicle storage building and also in the um, you know, vehicles that are being repaired are, are also gonna be stored in the other uh, building number one. So they will, um, the city uh, and, and their program and their number of you know, vehicles, number of uh, employees, number of visitor spaces that were anticipated will all be met on site. Let's go to the next slide. And this is, uh, I just wanted to talk quickly about stormwater management. Uh, and Chris, maybe you could just blow up that stormwater location map just a little bit, just blow that area up. So this is considered a, um, uh, we're considered new development. And with new development, we are required to um, um, meet and, and exceed the state requirements by 125%. So our, our plan is being, um, proposed and does meet and exceeds the, um, the requirement for 125% of uh, environmentally sensitive design uh, volume. So we are gonna do that through a series of stormwater management features. And you know, up, by, up along Hudson Street, we have a micro bio area in the, in the parking area. Uh, the city is also proposing a green roof over top the administration portion of the building. Uh, in the rear of that building, number one, we will have um, some hotspot treatment. Hotspot treatment is if you're vehicle washing and um, uh, stuff to, for, the, for the vehicles and the, and the trucks, uh, we, we have to do some special treatment there. So we will provide some storm scepters, uh, also some storm filters and 
uh, fill Terra boxes. So there's some special stormwater treatment that we can do to filter those um, those hotspot areas. Uh, Mr. Schumann, yeah. most of what you said is already in the papers. If you could just touch on anything that's important that's not in what you filed. Okay, well, I mean, for, for this, I, the only thing I, I'd like to point out on this is we did have some um, conversations with the Environmental Commission. The city did present to the Environmental Commission. At the time, we had a salt dome in the middle right there, and we had material bins all along there, which is closest to the stream. And uh, in response to some of the concerns on the on the on the salt and the salt barn, we moved that over to the west side of Building Number Two and relocated that. And we've also provided some additional stormwater in front of the salt barn that will. Um, uh, control the the um, salt from from getting into the um, receiving waterways. So right. we, we again we have a we have a good stormwater plan. We we meet all the city and state requirements. And um, um, any questions I can answer from there. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Well, I do have a question on the stormwater, but if you want to just shove it in here now, or yeah, go ahead, Christian. Sure. Um, was any consideration? Was any thought uh, or engineering? Um, brought to bear given the nature of the facility with uh, all due respect to Mr. Johnson and his excellent vehicle maintenance, the nature of these vehicles and their leaking oil and dripping fluids and hydraulic fluids and so on and so forth. It's not your run of the mill parking lot, right? This is plows and trucks and dump trucks and lots of hydraulic fluid and lots of oils. And um, is your stormwater system consider that or is it st strictly assuming surface runoff? No, no, we, we, we it definitely, definitely in, in those type of instances in municipality storage yards and type that, you know, they consider those hot spots. And with those hot spots, we, we do some, uh, you know, that's why I was proposing some of the, the, the storm scepter. We have storm filters. These are all um, varying types of um, filtering devices that, that do that, do the suspended soils, get the material uh, settled out of there and um, also treat the oils um, and, and provide those in the filters. I mean, some of the filters have carbon in them. Uh, they treat treat some of that uh, information. So I, uh, yeah, we did look at all that and it is a requirement. And, and is there any monitoring um, necessary by by either statute or, or design or requirement within the code? I mean, the yeah, city... if I could, um, Terry, yeah. if I could just uh, say something on that, um, we, you know, the, this facility will be covered under the uh, general permit, uh, stormwater permit, MS4 permit that MDE has um, issued the city. And part of uh, one of the minimum control measures, which is how they, they en ensure compliance with the permit, deals with what is called good housekeeping. And what that really means for a facility like this is that uh, standard operating procedures and other non-structural measures, what Terry has sort of uh, focused on has been some of the structural measures to address, uh, you know, contamination, possibly leaving the, you know, the, the envelope of the, of the site, of the building. But the non-structural measures are ensconced within the this, this standard operating procedures by law and require uh, the main, th those who are responsible for the permit, uh, the, the superintendents, to ensure that they control uh, leaks, um, waste um, oil, um, waste salt, or any other sorts of um, effluent things that could sort of foul the, um, the runoff from the site. So that is covered in both the structural and the non-structural side. And then I turn has back the city, to Terry. Has the city been in good compliance uh, to this point in that regard? Um, we have been in compliance. I mean, I'm fairly new with the city and we are right now working um, with our different operational groups and as, as well as folks outside of PW in, in transportation and in parks and planning to um, improve on aspects of the permit of, of those minimum control measures that uh, as I've sort of looked at it with, with some fairly new eyes uh, that I would like some improvements made on uh, pursuant to the requirements of the permit. But to your knowledge, there's no there's been no violations or complaints. There have been no violations um, that I am aware of um, that have you know emanated from any of the city facilities. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. That's it, Mr. Chairman, for me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Chris, go to yeah, that slide. Okay. 
Uh, I just wanted to touch on the forest conservation for this site. So this, um, this represents the preliminary forest conservation plan. This was reviewed and approved, um, at least getting up to this hearing tonight. Um, the, 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 the teal area represents the um, over by the salt dome and the barn. So that's the, uh, if you remember, I showed you that dark uh, dashed line in that existing map. So there was a clearing that was done already in order to fit this new program and this new plan on, we do have to go beyond the, the woods line uh, that's out there today. And we will clear uh, a half acre that, that represented by that teal color. Um, but in return for that, we are um, going to plant, uh, that's the, the darker green area. That's all, um, this is gonna, we're gonna exceed the, the clearing with plantings in the floodplain area. Um, and we're going to do 0.59 acres of reforestation. And then the, the um, purple areas up on the street trees, those count toward reforestation as well. Uh, we'll be putting street trees along the road and uh, we will exceed the, um, the, the clearing with, with the planting that we'll be providing. And then I guess more importantly is at the end of this uh, project, we will, or, or before we get permits, we're going to place all that light green in, um, a, a forest easement in perpetuity. So, uh, and that'll total about 2.31 acres. So, you know, out of this, almost a third of the site will be um, in a in a forest conservation easement in perpetuity, meeting all the forest conservation requirements. Uh, with that said, I think I'm done with the um, site plan preparation or, or presentation. And Leo, I'll turn it up back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Terry. So next up is um, Deb Schwab. She's been the landscape architect for the project, and she's going to talk briefly about the general approach to the um, to the plantings on the project. So, Deb, are you online? Yep. Here we are. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward landscape plan. Um, pretty much all the species used on site are native, with the exception of a few uh, crepe myrtles over on the eastern side, and that is simply because of the power transmission lines. BG&E has a fairly short list of what we can use in those areas, and the plantings we put in that area um, match what we did on the, ex the site next to it. Um, but other than that, native plantings, stormwater plantings, uh, we've met the regs that the city has. And if anyone has questions about any of it, I'd be happy to answer any. Great. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Schwab? All right, Leo, keep it rolling. Leo, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you. So these are just close-ups of the Byron Attention details, which are in the package reviewed and the step pond that drips uh, that um, takes care of the uh, uh, the uh, stormwater that goes off of the site. So I think that's just another point to mention. So um, next up is me. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, so the city comes to us with a program of elements they need to include in the public works building, and that's what's on your um, your screen today. Um, the project essentially provides administrative space for public works, maintenance shop, which is quite large, um, vehicle storage because there are build, uh, vehicles that need to be kept warm for use during the winter and um, kept inside to be ready to deploy at any moment. Um, and then the salt barn, of course, that makes good sense to everyone. And then the storage bins for that. And then of course the site components include the parking, environmental and stormwater management. So from this program, we come up with this with a plan for the building and so see, gosh, I think I got my, my Zoom a little bit messed up, but this will take you through it. So um, the first building, the front of the building includes the administrative offices with an entry and offices along the front, locker rooms, um, other amenity spaces that are required for the building, toilets with ADA compliant access, an elevator, um, and, and you know the things you'd find in a normal um, office building. And then in the back, we've got um, the maintenance building. And so this building, uh, does a few different things. It provides um, service for all the vehicles the city owns, including the fire trucks, which you, can, which you can see in the long lanes here, some of the larger dump trucks, and then the smaller vehicles for things as simple as oil changes and as complicated as transmission work. 
So um, that um, includes also areas for storage of product that we need to use and things as simple as water meters for the city. So building A is pretty straightforward and you can see the doors that are overhead on the back. Okay. So, and then we go to the second floor, you can overlook the um, double volume space for the shop just because of the long span for the building. And then on the second floor, we've got more administrative offices, a meeting room upstairs, locker rooms, you know, standard fare, nothing that you wouldn't expect to see. And then as Terry mentioned in his program, we've got a green roof on the front to help meet our um, um, stormwater um, quality and quantity um, components. Uh, nice feature because the front is a flat roof. And then let's go down to the next one. Simple elevations here. Again, I'm not gonna spend much time on these. The front is a conventionally built um, uh, structure with metal and, and uh, masonry and wood and glass, all the standard stuff. And then the back is a pre-engineered building, which will allow us to take advantage of the economies associated with that type of construction. Again, they pro provide a durability and longevity. So I think we'll be happy with that. Side elevations of those buildings. Again, just to give you an idea what it looks like. And we go to building two. So building two is our vehicle storage. There's an area which is not heated for vehicles that don't need to be heated. And then on the other end are areas that need to be heated. So these would have like street cleaning trucks and things like that. Very simple. Um, elevations of that building. Again, it's um, as you would expect, it's a pre-engineered metal building, lots of big doors and essentially designed to store trucks. And then the last piece we have on site is the salt barn. And so this is a, a mechanism that will allow us to keep the salt dry when we need to. Storage bins for bulk gravel, those types of things on this end. Relocated per earlier meetings with the uh, Planning Commission to uh, eliminate to the greatest extent practical any problems associated with salt storage, which we did have a problem over on the old Spa Road site, but this helps to mitigate that quite a bit. There's um, gravel washdowns in the front and special collection basins for any of the brine that would come out of the building during rainstorms. So which will be collected and, and, uh, and used elsewhere. So it keeps it from going into the um, uh, more sensitive environmental areas on the site. And this is what it looks like. It's pre-engineered, as I said, this seems to be the way um, jurisdictions like Annapolis are storing their salt. These are um, simple structures that um, do what they need to do at a, at a great price. So um, again, just moving quickly, this is kind of an aerial image from Google of the site. And then um, what we did is we laid the buildings into the site. So you can see what they look like. Couple quick renderings, this is the front, right? Let me see if I can get that to go big again. Let's see if I can zoom out. Let's squeeze some solar panels on that roof, Leo. Solar, Ooh, no, I don't think we have solar, but we have a green roof. If you know someone who wants to lease space up there, we can make that happen. Um, the other side of the building, again, trying to keep these forms simple and functional, um, aesthetically pleasing and um, provide for durability and longevity. Back of the building with some of the trucks in place, this is the flat area where we'll be doing the wash down and you can see the apron out here designed for that. Those are electric trucks, right? Uh, Michael told me they're all electric now moving forward. Did you say that, Michael? They have batteries. <laughs> um, here's another view with our uh, building number two for the storage. Again, trying to use every inch of the site to the most practical way we can. So there's parking that rims the edge and there's access to the trucks from, from all around the perimeter. Another shot of that building from a different angle. Um, here's a rough overview of the front so you can get a general sense of how it's all set on site. And then one, uh, one last thing I wanted to close on. So this is a requirement from the city that these buildings following on um, Mr. Zazali's comment, um, all of the city's buildings are required to be certifiable through the LEED program um, to the silver level, which is not a minimum, it's, it's a medium level, I would say. Um, these come with costs, of course, but the city's elected to, um, to, to vigorously pursue um, green building technologies where they can. And so this is a scorecard that shows us um, how we're scored on each one of these things from things as simple as 
water efficiency, like high efficiency toilets, to energy and atmosphere, which is the mechanical systems. And it even gets into things like how much site lighting we provide versus what we need. And so this is all graded by a third party who looks at all of this. And we're gonna end up with 51 points, which puts us just into the silver certification in compliance with the city's requirements. So we'll continue to monitor this as we go through the construction document phase, but it's a rigorous program. And in the end, I think the city will be happy with what they get. And so finally, just an overview of what we're doing here. We think it's a great site for this project. Um, Spa Road would have worked well, but I think there's higher and better uses for that property. I applaud the city for taking a second look at that and coming up with um, the idea that there might be a better alternative. In this case, the property became available through a sequence of events that, you know, kind of were fortuitous for us. And so we end up with a great site that's centrally located in the city that allows public works to do what they need to do um, in, in a functional and um, effective way. So um, I think that summarizes our presentation. We've talked about the parking issue. Um, and I think we're, we're covered on that. We are planning to have all of the vehicles that we need to have parked on site on site. And traffic is always an interesting one. The traffic requirements, when you think about what you had versus what, um, what you're going to add to the site, the reality is that there is no uh, single influx of a uh, flood of people that come in and out of this building. So it's not really a peak use kind of situation. The office demand is probably a nine to five type operation, but the trucks are used throughout the day and they come and go as they need to. So almost at any time there are people out and people in. So there are trips, but they're spread out and there is no peak demand at any one time. And of course, the one that we're most concerned about is when it snows, how's everybody gonna get in and out? And of course, at that point, there's not many people in the building, just the um, salt spreaders and the other trucks. So we believe it fits really well into this area and, and is in the right place in the city. So um, I think we've got that covered from our end as well. So with that, I'll stop talking and take any questions any, you have and uh, direct them to the right people. All right, board members, this is your chance. Mr. Chair, go ahead. Um, go ahead. No, you, you were first. I go ahead. Uh, I just a couple of questions uh, are related to. Well, first of all, just uh, Mr. Schumann mentioned it. The uh, the previous owner of the site was a warehouse. Could you just clarify that it was a warehouse? Um, yes, yeah, it, it was a local um, um, business here in town, and they. Um, it was a warehouse, the same warehouse office. I mean, it really wasn't much different than this layout. So uh, they, it was a warehouse, uh, it was um, um, absolute fire protection. And so it, since it had received site design approval, it, which it did, correct? It did. And uh, presumably to do that, they would have had to go through much of what you've just gone through and presented to us tonight in terms of traffic. Um, they, would, they presented to the planning commission, but not to the board. But to, to the planning commission, they did present, uh, you know, traffic, any traffic concerns or addressing those. And so, you know, clearly it was going to be used for something, if not similar than like what were at least being proposed here by the city. Correct. And I, the only other question I have is, um, it's been cited by the public uh, comments, is Hudson Street and the access onto West Street. It would solely be a right turn there? That is correct. Does that prove to be logistically problematical for salt trucks, bows, city trucks? I mean, I, I, if you have to take a right, where you take the left to head back into the other section of town. Uh, my understanding is the city's looked at all that and they understand that fully and they have no issues with it. You know, Michael, you were, my exact question was to get back into the city, you basically have to get back on 5301 and circle back down to Rowell Boulevard. Or, I mean, if the city's accepting that as the lesser of the two evils, then we're, who are we to question that wisdom? But that's right. We we have looked at that, and to tell you the truth, some a lot of times it's faster to go that way than to go back down West Street. I, so I, I don't um... disagree with you, Doctor Nash. <laughs> <laughs> it seems uh, counterintuitive, but it is the reality of it. Yeah, so, so we, we did look sure. at the, the circulation on the site. Okay, thank you. That's it, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Any more from Christian? No, that was it. Uh, 
Dr. Chen? Uh, I just had the same traffic question as uh, Mr. Walsh. All right, Mr. Dews? I had the same question, but now it's been answered, so <laughs> I won't uh, belabor it. I've got a couple questions. That I think they're more for Mr. Scott or Dr. Nash. Um, so the planning commission, they decide on approval of the site plan. And it doesn't really matter what we do. Well, I guess they're not gonna bother if we turn this down, is that right? Right, well, the two projects will be conditioned on the other. The, um, so just to clarify, the previous project with Absolute Fire didn't go to planning commission. That was when the process was administratively re reviewed by the Department of Planning and Zoning. Um, so this one will go to the planning commission tomorrow night, as I mentioned. The um, conditions for our recommendation are standard conditions that you see on, on all, most all projects. Number four is a unique one that has to do with arche uh, archeological investigation and monitoring. So we're requiring that there's some belief that there are some Civil War era Union camps out in this general vicinity. So we wanna make sure we find them if they're there. And um, so that'll be a condition, but this will be the um, conditioned on the site design approval. The site design approval will be conditioned on the special exception approval. The Board of Appeals is approving the use and the Planning Commission is approving the design. Will there be, will the art archeological report be available to the public? It should be. The requirement is the scope of which will be determined by the Chief of Historic Preservation and any reports reduced or artifacts found would be um, uh, submitted to the Director of Planning and Zoning. Uh, I'm just interested in the process with the the reorganization of the environmental function. Does the new deputy city manager have any role in this? She's been involved in the review of the project. Okay. So I don't know by what role do you? Uh, I'm just curious whether she had any connection with it at all. Kevin, I have a question for you, if you don't mind, if you're done. Sure. Um, after your conditions, there's a memorandum section dated 2, uh, 1029, you know the memorandum? Yes, that was the uh, memorandum from our chief of comprehensive planning because there's a requirement that special exceptions be consistent with the comprehensive plan. <clears throat> and Eric Leszczynski, who's the chief of comprehensive planning, wrote up a memorandum to that effect. And I thought it better to just attach it than to summarize but, it. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it was interesting because at one point that I was keen to chat about earlier was the policy four of chapter seven. It makes a recommendation or I don't know what the word, right word is there. It, it, make, it makes a note that given the proximity to Weems Creek, a program of water quality monitoring would be a, another effective way to enhance the project's visibility and, and stewardship. And, I, and I, I think I asked my question, I got an answer that good housekeeping and written into the law is required that the site um, not be sloppy and spill oil and fluids and so on and so forth. But, but there is no proactive or, or positive monitoring of what's leaving the site baked into city code and or the requirements or anywhere. This is sort of complaint driven, observation driven monitoring. Am I correct in that? I we have some other experts on the line here that might be able to chime uh, in. Um, I, this is Mike uh, again. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that it's complaint driven. I, I would say that it's it's uh, integrated into the standard operating procedures of the department. So who, it's not who has uh, oversight not, of the department's um, performance in that regard. Uh, you said who has oversight? Uh, the Maryland Department of Environment is, I mean, it would sort of fall to me to be responsible ultimately locally, I mean, within the city to make sure that the respective MD, divisions are complying with the MD permit. But MDE doesn't do site inspections. They, they do. They, they do. do. They do inspections. Uh, uh, but they're not on regular, uh, pardon me, they're not on, reg on a regular basis. They may be on a sort of a, uh, some randomized way in which they could they inspect the Many jurisdictions within Maryland, 
but uh, we are, you know, subject to EPA and MDE inspections. And I think the city has had an, an EPA inspection in, in the past uh, two or three years, something, something to that effect. The, the only the, reason I'm, full disclosure, the reason I'm bringing this up, and I'm, and I'm by no means even trying to remotely suggest that anybody on this entire call has anything to do with what I'm gonna say next. But I have been approached by neighbors, just given my proximity to Weems Creek and my house happens to be on Weems Creek, that there have been oil plumes that MDE was called to investigate. And they basically said, we acknowledge it's petroleum, but it's impossible for us to ascertain its source. So, um, most of my line of questioning was a little educational and a little, but, but it is written into this memorandum that monitoring would be a good thing. I don't know what that means. I'd be, I was just curious to hear your, the, 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 the planning department's thought on that, the, your as the director of that facility's thoughts on it. And, um, and I guess no, that's no, it. I, do I don't understand. want to hold up the project. I think it's a good project, right. an overdue project. Uh, <laughs> but I do want to be able to address my neighbors and colleagues that, uh, yeah, I voted for it or I didn't vote for it. And then I asked these hard questions. So that was all. You know, I, I appreciate the questions. I do appreciate the questions. And, and I think that um, we, you know, that their concerns can be allayed by the fact that, that, that what I mentioned for the site is one of the minimum control measures. An, an additional one is what's called the IDDE. That's the acronym. It's illicit discharge detection and elimination. That's another requirement by law that the city must comply with. So we have outfalls. Uh, so that if, uh, you know, to take the, the instance that you mentioned, there, there's an oil plume of some type in a, in a surface water body, the Weems Creek or whatever, whatever the surface water body is, the city under its IDDE protocols or would have to sort of embark on a process of detecting that that um, that illicit discharge and taking steps to um, eliminate it. And we are in the process of um, putting together our, you know a more robust uh, manual for dealing with that. So I, I'm I'm extremely confident that within short order, our goal is somewhere around the, probably by June to have a functional manual and then to sort of have a, a an extremely robust IDDE program to address issues like that. Now that does not, having said that, that does not prevent a bad actor from doing something that you know no one could have predicted. So, but it, but it does allow us that once that has occurred to be able to sort of have a rational and organized way for tracing where, you know, and, and taking steps to eliminate that particular um, illicit discharge. So mm -hmm. the, the MD4, M, MS4 permit is very all encompassing. It's, uh, it's part of non-point pollution um, protection uh, for uh, covered under the Clean Water Act of the United States. And it's, a, it's quite a robust program that um, has functioned very well in, in many watersheds and certainly in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Well, thank you for your thorough answer. I look forward to your success with that new program and I hope you celebrate it and make it widely known. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, one last uh, follow-up for, for the city on the traffic to exit onto West Street. I recall back during one of our recent hearings where there was a traffic study, I understand none is required here, that there was some measure of the performance of the intersection uh, an unsignalized intersection. Do, do we have any measure of the performance of the right turn on the West Street? I don't have a recent one, so I don't have anything um, more recent than three years old. Do you have any idea what it was then? Well, I know that when um, the Monarch Academies went in they had to put the pork chop at Hudson and West, which is what forces the right turn in, right turn out. That concrete triangle yeah. is yeah. called a pork chop. They had to put that in in order to bring the level of service at that intersection up. Um, then when the, um, the townhomes that are at right at um, 
Gibraltar and West Street um, town courts went in, they had to pay or contribute to the new signal at Gibraltar and West. And um, I don't know the numbers, but I know that that traffic signal was going to help Hudson Street's level of service because it would create more gaps for the traffic to be able to turn out of that intersection. So I believe it, it is probably operating above a, a D, but I don't, you know, I haven't had a study done recently, but I would suspect that those movements are, are in pretty good shape now with those two improvements. So um, I'm just, for an overview of how the system works, if you don't need a traffic study, then then you could have multiple projects on the same street that didn't need traffic studies, all of which are contributing to at least a common sense view that things are gonna get worse there, but there's nothing, the city doesn't have any handle to do anything about it, is that right? If there is a dangerous intersection, which granted is not defined, um, we can require a traffic study, or if a project is very close to an intersection, we can require a traffic study. So there is some discretion, but those projects, so those projects are on Gibraltar, so they're not impacting Hudson um, Street. Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned that, because the, the next case that's coming up, I saw a note in the file that the State Highway Administration will not provide traffic accident data. What is that about? Traffic accident data? Yeah, to decide whether or not um, the intersection is a dangerous intersection. They provide data to agencies upon request. All right. Okay. If I request data from State Highway um, for certain intersections, they will send me accident data, but they won't send it out to the general public. And you don't have anything from State Highway that says the Hudson Street intersection at West is dangerous? No, I mean, the there was a, a fatal accident on um, east of Gibraltar a few years ago, which was one of the reasons why we pushed very hard for that signal there. Okay, all right. I, I don't have anything else. Any, one more chance for any members of the board. Terrific. Okay, well, I think most of you know how this works, but under the virtual meeting procedures, uh, we continue this hearing until March 2nd. Uh, we can receive public comments up until noon on March 2nd. When we meet on March 2nd, we'll deliberate and make our decision. Apologize that it takes that long to do it, but that's our system. Thank you all very much for your preparation and your brevity. And uh, unless you're involved in the next case, you may be excused. Thank you. Julian, you'll invite the next team in, please. They're going forward right now. Bill, I also have a, a Kristen Uglick here. Is she with this? No, just uh, Brandon Stalker is the uh, owner and applicant for this one. Uh, Brandon, I don't see here. I'm one, that's why I was wondering if that's this is... That's all right. I think if Brandon's not there, then we can cover the, the uh, presentation. Okay, Peter and David are both here, though.
Okay. All right. Uh, we will now be talking about special exception 2007 to allow an expansion of a standard restaurant known as Evelyn's Place at 26, 2426 Annapolis Street in West Annapolis. Will anyone who plans to give evidence tonight please raise their right hand? No one? Um, I think maybe maybe that's that Brandon is under um, the name that Julian mentioned. It just that's what's listed for his Zoom name. So maybe we, we should bring him forward so he can be sworn in as well. I apologize. Give me one second. I just unmute them. Is this is this Brandon? Yes, it's a, that's me. I apologize. My girlfriend forgot to sign out of my Zoom account. All right, I'll bring you forward right now. Bob, in the meantime, Bob, um, we need to um, <clears throat> maybe put the exhibits in the record. I don't think we did for the last meeting. Yeah, the, the staff report and all the attachments and the PowerPoint and public comments are all admitted. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. All right. So, uh, anyone who plans to give evidence, please raise their right hand. Do you swear or affirm studies the penalties for perjury that the evidence you're about to give is true to the best of your knowledge? I do swear. Thank you. Yes. All right. So, who would like to tell us about this case on behalf of the city? Here we go. I'll, I'll begin. I'm Phil Dales with the law firm Liz Walsh and Simmons. Um, and as I. Phil, are you trying to prevent Jackie? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear all of what you I said. I think that I. Jackie, I'm just going to speak for a, a very brief moment before Phil goes into his presentation. Hmm? Go ahead, please. So we have, this is an existing restaurant that's located at um, the property at the corner. Excuse me? You're cutting in and out. Bob, can you not hear me? You're breaking up. You might want to get closer to the microphone. I don't know why that is. Um, I'm not muted and I'm not. Okay. Well, go ahead. How about now? We can hear you now. How about if we just turn this over to Mr. Dales to do the presentation since Mike and I'm going. Julian, I'm going to. Okay, you can hear me now. Okay, so this is the application by a standard restaurant that's located on Annapolis Street. That's it's um for an expansion. They currently uh, um operate out of um, half of the ground floor of this building. Okay. All right, we lost Jackie. Mr. Dales, would you like to go ahead? I would thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, Phil Dales here for the applicant. I'm an attorney at Liv Walsh and Simmons in Annapolis, Maryland. I also have with me the architect of the project, Peter Miles, and the owner and applicant, Brandon Stalker. Um, mm -hmm. I think we may be able to have a, a short presentation here and um, um, mitigate the loss of Jackie's um, testimony here because I'd ask that the um, staff report and our application and exhibits submitted to the board already are made part of the record. And then um, if that's that accepted, be admitted. Okay, thank you very much. And I would, for the sake of um, what I know is very important and the brevity of these virtual hearings, I'll simply proffer that the criteria required for this special exception um, to allow a restaurant of a total of 67 seats is addressed in the application statement and uh, the staff report and that both are accurate and sufficiently address all the criteria. And so if that proffer is acceptable to the board, um, then I would uh, make myself and the uh, architect um, available to any questions that the board have and address you know, any, um, any issues that exist in the board members' um, uh, review of this application request in that manner, rather than present 
um, what you already have in the materials. So if that is acceptable, then um, I would simply put us, uh, make us ourselves available for questions. Mr. Dales, that's a brilliant suggestion. Uh, I see we have Jackie back. Jackie, can you confirm that you have received evidence of appropriate notice and posting? Yes, we have received both affidavits of posting and affidavits of notification from the applicant. Uh, either of you, uh, well, I'll stand back and let my colleagues so, questions from the board for either Jackie or the applicant. No. No, I'm good. Rob, Dr. Chen. You're good. Uh, if someone want to just tell us a little bit about parking, are there any parking requirements or issues? I will um, proffer that that's addressed in the, in the application statement, but Mr. Miles, could you tell us what the uh, parking requirements are and where parking is being provided? Yes, I would be happy to. Let me just bring up my screen and I can share the site plan that was submitted. Let's find. The site plan. Um, so I am Peter Miles from the drawing board. So we're expanding the use next door. So uh, the board will be aware that in West Annapolis parking requirements as a result of the 2015 sector study were changed to be 15% of seating capacity. So parking is handled um, on site in the back of the property. We have parking spaces submitted here. So we have now we have 60 seats. So I will uh, just note for the board, there is a difference in how the city counts seats for indoor versus outdoor seating. So for purposes of seating for capitals, facilities fees and total seating, they have 60 seats. Um, so we have 60 seats at 15% is nine parking spaces. And then there are the second floor apartments. There are four units, that's four spaces. There's 13 spaces required and we have 19 spaces provided on site on the lot in the rear of the property. That's great. Okay, I just had one uh, comment um, that members of the board will have noticed. We had quite a few public comments, uh, almost all of them uh, in the nature of character references, what a fine Lawyer and neighbor, the applicant. Uh, Chairman Gallagher, this is for the next, the next um, uh, here, the next item on the agenda. Oh, Those I'm sorry. Letters. You're right. I got it. Sorry. We did speak with community associations and business associations yeah. in West Annapolis regarding this project, and only heard positive comments. Yeah. Great. Okay. All right. Well, um, if you heard us concluding the last hearing under the virtual hearing procedures. We're not able to decide this tonight. We have to wait until the March 2nd hearing. Uh, the public can comment up until noon on March 2nd, and we'll make a decision uh, after our deliberations on the evening of March 2nd. We thank you all for your uh, levity and preparation. And uh, Christian, do you have something? I just want to confirm that the applicant has seen all the conditions that the city has imposed and they accept them as written. We have. Thank you. Great. So uh, with that, we will uh, close the hearing for tonight to be resumed on March 2nd. Thank you, Mr. Thank you all again and uh, excuse you all and we'll take up the last agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I, I did want to say that since we're relying on that proffer and all the board having read the materials that just urge that the uh, the complementary nature of this expansion is uh, we think well addressed in the, in the statement and the drawings. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank nice you. All right, Julian. The next members are coming forward and we still have Mr. Dales here with us. On this one, it may be more helpful. So, Bob, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, Jackie. Okay, so Bob, Bob, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, so my laptop has informed me that I have an unstable internet connection, so I'm hoping that that um, we will be able to make it through this without me losing whatever is causing that. Okay. <clears throat> this uh, application has a couple of So I think we're just waiting for this. Do we have everyone, Phil? Well, uh, we need to bring forward the applicant here, Julian, is uh, Ms. Stacy Rice. And we also have Kim Burke. Right. So, so let me just introduce the application. Um, this is the property that's located. Located. She's. We can have uh, Ms. Rouse pull in. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm actually. Kim and Stacy are both on the screen, Phil. You need to sit down. Julian, maybe uh, if you could get a message by text to Jackie uh, in the chat that you could call in as an option. Yeah, I I'm sending her the call the, the call in number right now. In the meantime, are we- Do we have everybody now, Phil? We do, we, we're, we're ready. Tammy, did you have something to say? Just a reminder about the exhibits. We admitted them in the in the uh, Evelyn's. Do you want to do it in this? Okay. Well? What I'm going to do is I'm going to log out of this and I'm going to um log in on my iPad. Looks like we've lost Jackie again. Phil, would you like to go ahead and start us off? We'll catch up with Jackie when she's available. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in this case, um, there are we're going to get again proffer that the criteria have been addressed in the statement we submitted and the materials that were attached to the statement and in the staff report, which addresses both the criteria and the special exception and variance. Um, there are, however, uh, two issues that I, I'd like to provide a little more detail on. Um, one is uh, a legal interpretation as to the requirement of a variance or not. And the other is um, a, a clarification or a, a, to make sure that we're all clear on the offsite parking condition the applicant is agreeing to. Um, and so I'll hope that Jackie's able to join us uh, for uh, the city's perspective on both of those issues. Um, but I'll, I'll do my case by proffering and we've met the criteria and then allowing the applicant, uh, Ms. Rice, just to give a very, very brief uh, description of her current business and where, what she's hoping to do at 79 Franklin. Is that acceptable? Yes, sure, go ahead. Ms. Rice, um, I don't know if we sworn everyone in so far, Mr. Chairman. Who's missing? I, I, I just, uh, was everybody, was everybody, um, connected when, when they were sworn in, so, okay. Yeah. All right, so Ms. Rice, could you uh, proceed to tell the board about your where your current business is and what you're hoping to do at 79 Frank? Sure, thank you, thank you all. Um, my name is Stacy Rice. I own a law firm called uh, the Law Offices of Stacy B. Rice, LLC, um, kind of known as Rice Law. Uh, I'm at 23 West Street now. I've had my own law firm for almost three years, uh, although I've been practicing uh, in Annapolis exclusively for about 20 years. Uh, I do exclusively family law at this point in the stage of my game. Um, I'm ingrained in the Annapolis community. My hope and my dream um, 
is to stay here uh, permanently. And the opportunity to purchase this building is really um, a dream come true for me because I not only want to stay and establish my law firm in Annapolis, but I also see it as an opportunity to become uh, an indefinite part of the community um, and, and really establish a legacy for my family. Uh, I can tell you, I, I professionally am, am very uh, invested in this venture, but also personally, uh, I grew up in a very small town in New England and a house that was built in 1680. So I uh, have a love for historic buildings. I have an appreciation for uh, the historic nature of this building in particular. Um, and um, Annapolis is kind of my home away from home in my small uh, New England-like town. So I'm very hopeful that, that this is successful both for my profession uh, and also just to be able to create something for my family uh, to hopefully own indefinitely. So thank you. Otherwise, just press pound. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rice. Jackie. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry, Phil. Uh, I, heard, I heard some feedback, I think, from Jackie's phone or something. Yeah, Mrs. Right. I think she's trying to call in by phone now. I think that's what you heard. Good. Jackie, I see you muted yourself. Are you able to, to, um, to unmute and, and confirm that you're there? Okay. Um, We'll keep no, going. No, she's coming on right now. Uh, okay. She, she just called in. Great. So Jackie, it's a uh, star six to unmute if you uh, need that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's crystal clear, Jackie. That's great. <laughs> okay. This is kind so of a I'll, bizarre. I'll Chairman, to let Ms. Rouse uh, present for the city, and then we'll come back to Mr. Miles. Go ahead, Jackie. Okay. So what? So um, I actually, while I was calling in, missed the entire thing that that Phil had said. But the application is to convert an existing single-family dwelling on Franklin Street to um, professional office. And even though the property is zoned professional office, and a professional office would normally be a permitted use, because of the, the lot size, um, it required special exception approval for this for this particular for this use, and there were a number of other challenges that the applicant has faced in terms of bringing this conversion to fruition. Um, that we've worked through with them. That they include the variances to the um, side yard requirements and to the lot width because the because of the, the lot size. Um, they also have to get HPC approval, which they have on a preliminary basis to add the ADA lift on the side of the building, which is one of the reasons why they need a side yard variance also. They also needed, need additional parking beyond what is provided on site. And they have, uh, we've included with the application some spe special conditions related to the offsite parking um, that's been, administ it's been administratively approved to allow them to have off-site parking within 600 feet. And they actually have made arrangements to have um, two spaces on an adjacent property, but also additional spaces in both, two additional spaces in both Dot's garage and the 60 West Street garage. So they will actually wind up, if they exercise all those options with an excess number of spaces beyond what is required for the use of this site. Um, so that they had previous, there were previous challenges related to this property going back to 2009, when there was a, a prior attempt to convert it from single family to office. And as part of that process, um, they got approval to add the parking spaces that you will see on the site plan in the front of the building. And they got variances to the buffer requirements for those spaces. And they also had a critical area variance to allow for the increase in lot coverage. So those things, so, so this has been a long ongoing process to, to, to change the use of this building, which to a use which is really much more consistent with the surrounding land uses, um, which are all non-residential. So we are recommending approval of the project subject to a number of conditions enumerated in the staff report. Okay, and uh, Mr. Dales, the applicant is comfortable with the conditions? 
We are, uh, Mr. Chairman, I did want to provide some clarity on one of the conditions. And um, I, I would also proceed with two other small issues while I've got the um, design experts on the line and then Mr. Miles and his work. Okay. Okay. So uh, I think uh, Ms. Rouse, there you go. Uh, so Mr. Miles, uh, could you unmute for a moment? Yes. Thank you. Um, now, could you just tell the board briefly um, the square footage and how many um, uh, parking spaces that we are required to have and um, tell the board where we're placing the ADA just for the context of what's happening at HPC after this hearing? Yes. Okay, so uh, very briefly, the, the building is a historic structure. So there are, other than the ADA lift, there are no changes to the building on the exterior. So there's a ground floor, second floor, attic level and basement. So per code, the, uh, the basement and the attic level cannot be used as um, a, an office use. So they will be for storage only. So for the purposes of parking, there will only be employees and an area calculation for the first and second floor. So on the plans that are submitted, we provided first floor and second floor office areas, um, which is 1648 square feet. So it's one, one parking space per 300 square feet. So that works out to five parking spaces. So on site, and let me just switch to the site plan. So to orient everyone, here is the building. There are three parking spaces at the front of the property. So three of the spaces are provided on site and then two are provided off site um, per the condition that Ms. Rouse described. Uh, the, um, we had a hearing last week with HPC. So there's a provision in the code that the zoning approval needs to be given first. This hearing has to go ahead and be approved first before HPC can approve the change for the accessible lift. So we had that hearing last week. Um, as far as the substance of what was presented, the board and city staff agree that this proposed lift is acceptable. You know, we've gone through the ordinary process of meetings and a pre-application hearing. So the lift would be located on the side off of the primary facade. And this will satisfy, um, you know, this is a change of use to a commercial building. So we have requirements to meet under both IBC and ADA as far as accessibility requirements and site access. So an accessible parking space will be one of the three spaces located at the front of the property. Um, the existing walkway will be expanded slightly to provide access to the lift. And then um, a concrete walk behind that is actually will be removed because there will be no access from the site to that, uh, which actually results in a net reduction in impervious coverage on the property of just a little bit. Okay, thank you, Mr. Miles. and. Um... You may have negated the need for Ms. Burke's testimony, but I, I will ask you one other question. Could you just confirm the accuracy of the, uh, the distances uh, stated in the staff report for the variances? Yes, those are accurate. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Ms. Burke, uh, just several questions for Ms. Burke. So uh, could you confirm that the, park, the off-site parking shown in the exhibit with the 600 foot radius from the site that all of those are off-site parking facilities are within the 600 foot radius. I think. Uh, Can you hear me now? There we go. Yep. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. And can do you agree with Mr. Miles that the, the uh, proposed uh, alterations to the site will not result in any uh, new impervious surface, increased per impervious surface? No, I think the the total, we're actually, since we're removing that um, sidewalk behind the lift, it will actually be a slightly, a slight reduction of impervious, about 40 square feet. Okay, thank you very much. And I think that's it for the testimony from my experts. Um, and again, I'm, I'm proffering that the other criteria for both the special exception and variance have been addressed in the statements. And so I won't repeat that presentation this evening, but um, I do have um, another issue that I'd like to address um, for the variance, and then one for the, um, the park, the offsite parking. And so I, I think it's probably best that I address the, um, the condition for offsite parking first. Um, that's a condition of approval for the special exception. And um, I wanna be clear that the, the condition um, indicates that 
by each uh, by each calendar year, the applicant will uh, provide documentation that we've submitted uh, as one of our exhibits to the director of planning and zoning um, to confirm the um, availability of the parking for at least uh, the year that uh, we're required to do that by the condition. And um, so what I wanted to make clear is that if there are three sites on site or three parking spaces on site, that condition uh, requires that we provide um, three spaces off site within the document, within the places we've documented the availability um, of, of, of that parking. And so each year we're required to affirmatively do that and to not do so is a violation, uh, a zoning violation by this condition. Uh, I just wanted to be sure that everyone is clear and if the board members are unclear about where those facilities are or what will be required of the applicant for this condition, that, that you ask those questions for our understanding of the condition because as I've described it, the applicant understands and agrees to that condition. Thank you. All right. So my next issue that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on is the variance. And um, I wanna apologize for not being able to be as brief and efficient on this matter. Um, I'm not doing it just to make a point. Um, when an applicant requires a variance uh, and even if we're able to obtain it, then in future, um, many more of the things you may do to may need to do to modify your property for unforeseen needs now will require them to come back to me for modification to that variance or come back to you in, in many instances. Um, and that is um, something that I feel I have a duty to avoid for my clients, even though it's good for me that they have to come back. Um, so in this case, um, there are variances being applied for and um, which the staff recommends approval for on the lot width and the side yard requirements. And um, we believe, uh, we initially believe no variance should be required uh, for this property. And I wanna explain what my view is on that um, and present to the board the legal interpretation that I have so that you know, if, if the board can deliberate now or consult with its attorney um, between now and the next hearing uh, uh, as to whether the board may find that no variance is required in some of these instances. And to the extent that any of the variances should not be required, we would ask the board to make that finding. In the alternative, we believe that if a variance is required for the side yard in all the ways that the staff report indicates that we have met those requirements. So I presented the application, the alternative to state that if no variance is required, we would ask for that finding. And if the variance is required by your interpretation of the law, that we uh, be granted that variance. So um, very quickly, I'll explain um, my rationale here. Uh, for the board's consideration. Building conversions are addressed in 2138030C. Um, and the code there states that no building shall be converted to conflict with or further conflict with the lot size requirements of the district in which the building is located. So if you look at the bulk table for the P districts, the question becomes, in my interpretation of the law, whether the conversion from residential to a professional office building um, furthers or makes uh, or, or worsens the, um, the, the non-compliance. The building is non-compliant with regard to lot width now. Um, and we clearly would say that that does not change in the case of this use conversion. The argument that may be made against that is if the, the new use was associated with a more narrow lot width, I'm sorry, um, if the, uh, the new use uh, required a, a wider lot width, then that non-compliance would be seem to be increased. So if, if you're, for example, in our case, um, a residential lot is required to be 50 feet wide and our lot's approximately 30. If the requirement for an office were 60, that would increase the non-compliance. Instead, the office requirement is only 40. And so the non-compliance is actually reduced by this conversion. That's the case for um, uh, all of the, the requirements of the, of, of, that we are facing as bulk challenges with one specific um, exception. The side yard requirement here is actually 5.6 feet because the building um, is over 26 feet and the notes in the code provide um, that so note six says that subject to note four, one interior side yard of this building may be less than 10 feet 
provided the sum of both side yards is at least 10. But then you go to note four because six is subject to four. And it states that unless the building height exceeds 25 feet, in which case the interior side yard shall equal one fifth of the building height. Buildings 50, uh, 50 feet or more uh, in overall width as projected upon the front lot line shall have side yards not less than 10%. That's not applicable. It's just unless the building height exceeds 25 feet, in which case the interior side yard shall equal one fifth the building height. That note four is applicable to both residential and offices, meaning the side yard uh, here for a building above 25 feet does not change with the use conversion. So again, we're not um, furthering or, or worsening the non-compliance. And for those reasons, uh, we initially thought we needed no variance uh, because we thought the wheelchair lift would be permitted in a side yard. Um, we have conceded that a wheelchair lift um, may not be committed, uh, permitted in a side yard. And we're saying essentially that's the only reason we need a variance at all is because we're um, creating ADA compliance on the building in the downtown where um, there often is the opportunity to do that. We are doing that. So we're asking for the variance for wheelchair lift, but I'm also asking you to, to if you agree with my legal interpretation, find that no variance is required for the side yard um, of the existing building or for the lot width. And if you find that, it would be helpful to my clients so that if they ever have the need to change um, the use of this building in any way um, or to modify the building, that at least they won't be coming to address all the criteria for the variance with regard to those variances. So it, it would reduce the complexity and save us some time. I hope, I hope that that was clear that our argument, while complicated, is clear and, and set out in my statement. But if there are any questions I'd like to address them now, um, just, just so that um, I know that after this hearing's over and you go deliberating between now and the next meeting, that um, I've made the, the case that I'm hoping to make for a client. Um, but again, I think if variances are required, the most important thing here is that we've addressed those criteria in the statement and believe that um, you know, the food should be approved the variance as the staff recommends. All right, questions from the board? Chris? I'm chomping a bite on this one. Um, so Mr. Dales, you're, you're proposing that we approve the use change without considering the necessity for the variance. Is that what you're, what you're proposing? Well, so I'm saying the use changes re requires a special exception. And so we've met those criteria. Yes. And then the city is saying that uh, they believe that a, a, the use change requires the variance, essentially, even if you weren't changing the building at all, if you didn't have to okay. have a safety lift. I got you. How does that relieve you from the, the variances should modifications come in the future? Well, again, if those if the future mod now this use would be permitted subject to this variance that you'd be granted. So you know, it, it's hard to predict what might what might come. We have nothing in mind. This isn't setting anything up. It's just to say that if we were to again, you know, um, modify anything about the use or modify anything about the building that would affect this approval, then we're back to not only ask for the new thing, but also ask to modify this according to those standards. If you find that it's not required, which I believe is the case. We won't have to do that every time that they need any adjustments to the property. I'm with you on the first one. I can almost be convinced to say the use can be changed without the uh, give you the we could grant the special exception without the variance. But I don't think it, I don't think it affords you any relief from any future variances. Agreed. That, that's not what I'm saying. If the future if the future change uh, wasn't of the same nature, if we were changing to a use that uh, created a non-compliance or uh, uh, didn't meet some standard of the code, we would still need a variance for that specific thing. That's not what I'm arguing. No, I'm not talking about, the, yeah, okay. I'm saying if there's a variance granted, then I always have to make sure any future use change um, addresses the variance criteria as we uh, as we make the change. Uh, I'm, only because it's not consistent with our liberal distribution of uh, variances around here for these narrow lots, right? Like that is our dis default position. We're very, we're very understanding of the of the of the twenty one seventy two oh one oh nature of the city of Annapolis. So I would reluct I would be reluctant to do anything that's not consistent with our past behavior. That would be my only position. Jolly, uh, I would say actually there's a, a 
first of all, I think the staff would, would um, and maybe you should ask Jackie about this, but I think the staff's reason for requiring the variance here is based on uh, what's unofficial precedent. There is no actual legal precedent in these matters, as you know, but because the city has required a variance in similar situations in the past, they required it here. So we eventually just said, okay, we'll agree to disagree but, and we'll uh, prove the case for the variance, but partially in the interest of um, you know, the economy of resources for this board, I think that the question um, as to whether a future variance or future change would uh, require us to move variance is not really the issue. That's my, I'm explaining the purpose for why I'm asking yeah. this to sort of apologize to you why I'm having to do this. But I think the question is, is a variance required or, or is not, is it not? If you find that it is not, I think that will save, that will create you know, this unofficial precedent that if you're changing the use in a way that does not make non-compliance worse, that you're not getting a lot of variance requests um, for matters that shouldn't really require variances. Wouldn't you, your client sleep better knowing that the, the project is properly papered and that somebody couldn't come along later and say they never got their variance? It'll still be properly papered if you find that the no, no variance is needed here. Well, it could be challenged, maybe. It could. Um, you know, I think that the we're admitting a variance is needed for the wheelchair lift, and I think if you find that variance should be granted, then we would be properly papered. Okay. I have another off the sort of use... Um, is this, is the law from an LLC? Ms. Rice, you're muted. Yes, it is. And, and could you not operate your law firm in this property zone residential as a uh, sole proprietor LLC? I Would defer to fill on that question. No, her, her um, office would not meet the requirement for the residential office. This is a professional office because we're okay. So it's, um, is the sale of the building contingent upon the, the, the use change? It is, and we're tight yes. on, our, uh, on our closing schedule. So you know, we know that this won't be decided until the next meeting and then we are able to achieve or ask for HPC approval immediately after that. Um, but we are understanding from HPC they have no substantive issues with the design. Okay. Well, you, you can count on us for a quick decision as, as, uh, under Mr. Gallagher's leadership. Thank you. That's it. I'm done pestering you. Other questions from the board? Uh, I have a question, um, Mr. Chairman. Just a clarification in the staff report on page seven, and maybe Jackie, I don't know if she's still on, um, can answer it. There's a typo in the northwest um, side, 5.6 feet on the northwest side west side to and then there's a parent uh, a parentheses i don't know if that's two feet or what that num parentheses is supposed to be okay. i'm Maybe sorry can anybody answer that what, what's uh, the page number i can tell you Here that's I referring out oh. hi jackie Hi, this is, I've never done this just being on the phone for these meetings and I'm finding it very challenging. Um, um, Jackie, so on, on page, yeah, on page ahead. seven, on page seven, the second to last paragraph, mm -hmm. uh, the last line of that paragraph, uh, there's a parens instead of a number and I just need to know oh. what that number is. Okay, I, um, I'm going to ask, so that would, I, I think Peter, Peter Miles is on the it's phone. Zero. I, I don't have the site plan in front of me anymore. So it, um, it, it's effectively zero feet. Well, zero. I think we're inches. Um, but I think given that it's an open parent, a right parentheses, you had meant to hit zero and had the shift key down. Right. So that um, is the side, Nadine, where the, the ADA lift is. Right, so when right. that is installed, it will be right up against the property line. Got it. That Thank side. you. But I think there's been provisions made for how maintenance on that side. That was all worked out through the building permit and the HPC, the building review and the HPC review. Got it. All right. I, I would just like to, to, to make a statement about the necessity of the variances. The board has heard two previous cases for changes in use in the last few years where we did require um, for a change in use 
variances to the bulk requirements. One was the 15 Maryland Avenue requirement. And another one was a case I think that you all heard last year for 26 South Street. And we made a determination that these variances were required um, based on past precedent and how you know the code is structured. So that's why they were told that they needed the variances. All right, thank you, Jay. There's one other typo to correct. Um, I'm, I'm very glad that Ms. Chen asked about the one typo because I think in the technical difficulties we had earlier, um, the city was going to note on condition number two, which is the off-site parking requirement, there is a typo in the staff report stated condition, which we agree to. The typo um, is very simple. It, the, it's condition two and it refers to itself. It says this condition, but then it says number four. That four just needs to be changed to a two. <laughs> All right, any other questions from the members of the board? All right, uh, I think that's it. Okay, thank you all very much. And um, we'll um, mark the uh, staff report along with all of its exhibits, Tammy, um, and I guess the PowerPoint presentation uh, and the public comments. And uh, Thank you all very much. I think that's it. Um, you know the drill. We'll get back to this on March 2nd and have a decision for you. Thank you all very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Uh, all right. I don't think we have any other business, do we? Hi, Kim. No. For the next meeting, you only have these three continued public hearings. That, that's fine. Okay. Uh, Did we hear what happened in our case where it went to um, Court of Appeals? It wasn't a due? Circuit Court. Yeah. The, yeah, the petition, we finally got the, um, are we talking about the loss at Eastport Landing? Uh, yeah. No. Uh, the, the, the barbecue place, I think the, it was. <laughs> Adam uh, Cribs. Yeah, is, is Joelle on the line? Uh, no, th this is Sally. That's going to court on, on mon next Monday. Monday. I knew we were getting close. Thank you. Right. There has, however, been an appeal filed of the, um, the lost, um, lost case, and um, that was just recently filed. So it's at the beginning of the process, the court process. Okay. Hopefully we'll all be around to see that one too. <laughs> I, have, really? I have my doubts though. <laughs> all right, we just need one more motion tonight. I move oh, to adjourn. adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you very much. You. See you in the spring.